Welcome back to the Code Ryan podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Simon Grimm. And today we're going to talk about mostly mobile development related things like React Native and kind of the state of mobile development and stuff like that. But before we kind of get to that, Simon, could you just kind of maybe give me a background of your story of how you kind of became a mobile developer and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Ryan. So I'm Simon Grimm, uh, based in Germany. Uh, I run multiple online sites. I run the Ionic Academy, which is actually a different topic. So there's Ionic, uh, also a framework in that space we want to talk about. And since uh, earlier this year, I run galaxies.dev, which we had a different plan, but is now focused mostly on React Native. So that's also what we're going to talk about. Um I'm self-employed for six years now, uh, running these projects and little side projects, uh, doing basically living the creator dream now. The whole backstory is probably a bit too long. I'm going to give you the TLDR version. So I started as a um, native iOS developer at a company, uh, which was kind of cool. Like I got into Objective-C and Swift back then, and I to this day I still like Swift because of its syntax and how it works. Um, but shortly after, I got in touch with Ionic, which was a framework back then in 2014, I think it came up, uh, to build cross-platform applications with web technology. So you write your app with HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and then you can bundle it up. Back then it was Cordova uh, to build native iOS and Android apps. And that kind of fascinated me. I blogged about it. Um, I created a YouTube channel. I wrote some eBooks. Uh, I did pretty much everything you have to do if you want to do passive income and <laughs> want to become a creator. And uh, somehow it turned out and I created this membership site, Ionic Academy, and um, that worked pretty well for me. Um, so I really like Ionic and I still use it a lot, uh, which basically helps web developers to quickly create native apps. But I also noticed that this is like, if you work with something for basically six, seven, eight years, every day, you think like, this is the biggest thing in the world. Everyone should know about it. But then you take a look at the numbers and you see like, oh damn, Ionic, the market is, is it's such a fraction. And then you see like, everyone's in the world is using React. And I'm like, huh, Ionic is mostly Angular. What do I do? How do I keep my future safe? Uh, so I decided to open up and do a bit more about React and um it's just for me the closest thing to what I've been doing to now use React Native. So I could have also picked like Next.js, which is cool, but I just like this whole intersection of web and mobile and React Native fits perfectly into this. So I'm now uh, all about Ionic and uh, React Native at this point. Perfect. Well, I know those are definitely two topics we want to cover <laughs> today for sure. So I think maybe we'll start with kind of React Native, and then we'll kind of get into maybe some cross-browser solutions like Ionic and different things like that. Sure. So I think a good place to kind of start here is maybe just like, what is React Native? How is it kind of different from React? And just kind of start there, and then we'll maybe move into uh, React Native versus some other solutions like Flutter, Ionic, and different things like that. Yeah, sure. So uh, React JS, probably everyone knows it as like the biggest... Uh, JavaScript framework on the market to build websites. and I mean, React itself is not really a framework. You could better call Next.js a framework itself. Uh, React is just a library. But anyway, mostly what you can do with React is write websites and JavaScript stuff. But eventually, uh, the team at Facebook, so back then it was still Facebook, now it's Meta, of course, or Meta, um, they discovered that writing native application was kind of hard and the process is like, it takes a lot of time. If you've ever done this, like using Xcode or Android Studio and de you deploy to a device or simulator and then you redeploy and redeploy and just takes so much time. And I think actually it is still to this day just like that. And so they created the solution with React Native, which allows you to use React as a library, but to create native mobile applications for iOS and Android that you can just get into the app store just like any other application. And I don't know if people still have objections about cross-platform applications, but I'm pretty sure you're going to use apps on your phone that are built with cross-platform technology. Just like we're using a ton of Electron apps uh, on our desktop PCs, we pretty sure have Flutter, React Native, or Capacitor, or Cordova applications running on our phones and we don't even notice um, so there is a difference between React Web and React Native for sure. Um, for example, the, the biggest thing is on, on React on the web, you use HTML, div, B, 
H1, whatever, like the, the whole web standards. But if you write a React Native application, you got to use some different components, which are under the hood transformed into the native elements. Like you got a list view, you got a text, you got an image. Uh, and there are like a handful of core components that come with React. There are tons of libraries, of course, because it's the React ecosystem. Everyone has some opinions about how to do things right. So uh, there are like at least five to 10 really great uh, component libraries and styling libraries that you could use with React Native. And um, yeah, you just have to keep in mind that it is different. Like you can't completely reuse your React web code for React Native. This is an important part. Uh, which is actually different for Ionic or Capacitor-based apps. Maybe we can talk a little bit, like uh, a minute about this in the end. Um, but it's just different code. But under the hood, it's still React. So if you learn React and come to React Native, it's actually not a far journey. Like you just need to learn a few additional things and then you're ready to build native apps. And that has definitely been my experience with it. I don't tend to write a lot of kind of React Native currently as uh, I've been at my current job for about three years, so we just use React and we don't have a native app. But I know prior to that, I was using React Native some just with kind of more personal projects and stuff. And I would definitely say that if you know React, transitioning to React Native, it is not too bad whatsoever. There are like some fundamental differences, though. Like I kept finding myself wanting to like grab an unordered list or UL <laughs> and it's like, wait, this this is not a thing here. So you, you are going to like... You'll, if you're transitioning from React to React Native, you'll probably run into some of those things, but you just can Google, how do I do a list at React Native? And you'll have a, I think it's a, a list component or something like that, that, yeah. that you can use. So it's, it's a pretty seamless transition. And I know uh, for me, it was definitely, I really enjoy mobile development and would say that there's with the kind of constraints of being on a mobile phone and just that it actually can allow for a bit kind of even easier development in some ways to where on a kind of browser and doing web development, you have different screen sizes a lot, and you're also kind of working with cross browsers and different things like that. And you can definitely run into some stuff with mobile development with like uh, iPhone versus Android and different things like that as well. Yeah, um, but, but, but there's definitely less less real estate to cover yeah. if you just start target like yeah. phones or maybe tablets, but still it's, yeah. it's different than a browser. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think that is a kind of good setup on like what React Native is and some of the main differences between that and React. Um, but I did kind of see on your channel that you also had maybe a couple videos on flutter so how would you maybe compare react native to flutter as you know someone that's maybe thinking about getting into mobile development these might be a couple of the core kind of uh libraries that they're considering when kind of moving this way so what do you kind of think about these two different libraries and how would you kind of compare them yeah, so I'm I'm not a super expert in Flutter. I've done a few things with it to to get a feeling for it, and I made a little comparison video about Flutter, React Native, and also Capacitor. From from what I've seen so far, there are a few key differences. Now, of course, the first one, Flutter uses Dart. So if you come from a web developer background, uh, <laughs> this is a completely different language you got to learn. And like, I, I don't know, I'm in the web developer circles on Twitter. Like, you never hear somebody talking about Dart. Uh, it's, pro I mean, I mean, it's, I guess, it's a friendly community, and you you find a lot of helpful stuff about it. But it's just a completely different thing. On the other hand, if you've been a developer for like three, four, or five years it's honestly not too hard to get into a language like Flutter. Like, you, you know how object-oriented programming languages work in general. Like, you can also get into Python in, like, a few weeks. It's, at some point, as a developer, um, it's not too hard to transition into that. So, with that being said, Dart is actually a pretty nice language. Uh, if, you, if you learn it, then uh, you're up to something cool. Um, there are, of course, differences in terms of how the app turns out. Um, people sometimes say... The Flutter apps are more native. Um, the the whole argumentation around what is native and what isn't native, it, it's it's I don't I, I actually don't like it. Like we as developers do these arguments, like oh my native app is so native, and and then I make the like what about your grandma? If your grandma is installing an application from the store, is she interested in what the, is that application native or built with React Native? No, she doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Like if the buttons are big enough and she can press them, like <laughs> she's happy. <Yeah. laughs> so um, 
they're always like you can always argue what is native and how many layers do we have in between flutter is using this the skya engine or use this in the background which is basically painting every pixel on your screen uh react native renders to the actual ios or android components like they all do something but so is like if you're using unity if you're a game developer you're mostly using unity and and there's always something in between so um in terms of the output, I think both Flutter and React Native applications are just great. There is one thing when it comes to coding the app, which is fundamentally different to me. So um, when you build React Native applications, you're kind of free to do anything you want because it's React and there are tons of libraries and frameworks that you can use from styling to components to hooks and everything else. If you get into Flutter, like you have more of a closed ecosystem like, there's nothing you really need to install. Like, you start a Dart project, and then you just import the libraries and probably add some pub packages with this manager. But there's, like, it feels like everything's already there, especially in terms of the UI. So, as I said, for React Native, there's pretty much no UI. Like, you, you got to build everything yourself. When I came to it, I was like, where's the button? Where's the good-looking card? Where's the list component? Where's, like... There's nothing. Uh, and if you get into Flutter, like they have tons of components. And they, I mean, they usually by default follow their uh, material design spec. So it can look kind of odd on iOS. There are some tricks to make this work. Uh, and they also have like a Cupertino design theme for all components. Of course um, they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is a different way of building apps. It is a bit more like Swift UI, I think. It's like, you nest all these widgets in themselves and uh, it feels very mechanical. That's what I used, I think, to describe it before. Whereas React Native or web, it's like painting on a canvas and I can do CSS, I can position wherever I want. And if you're using Dart, it's more like that, 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 I want to add this element, this widget here, there, right, left slot. Uh, it feels a bit more like that. To be honest, it was actually a nice, like, doing something else from time to time, but um, I don't know. Yeah, some people like it more, some not. I think the results in general uh, are both fine with Flutter and React Native, whatever you pick. Yeah, and I I agree. I think that people get into these discussions on, like, what's more native, what's less native, and, you know, it's uh, at some level we have to work at some, like, layer of abstraction anyways. So, like... I think at the end of the day, what matters is the application that you're delivering to your end user and whether you use Flutter or React Native or whatever it might be, I think that you can largely get to the same spot with kind of using either of these tools. And to me, it sounds like Flutter might sounds a little bit more kind of like angular in which it's maybe has more things out of the box, maybe a little bit more opinionated, a, bit, a little bit more structure and React Native is a little bit more React-ish to where it's kind of unopinionated and you can kind of do anything you want with the styles and the structure of your app and stuff like that. Does that sound like a, a fair kind of way to think about it? Yeah, that's actually a, a good idea to think about it. Yeah, Angular definitely has more opinions, um, which some people enjoy because it gives you like a better architecture for your app and everyone can easily get into it. Uh, yeah, I think the comparison is kind of okay. Awesome. Well, I think that with that, the next place I'd like to kind of go to, and we've touched on this a little bit, but why why would someone choose to decide to create a kind of specifically like mobile application using something like Flutter or React Native compared to just making a web application that has like very mobile friendly design and stuff like that? Like what what would be the benefit of creating something that's a bit more native to someone's phone rather than just creating a web application that someone can still use on their phone. So this is interesting. What we talk about now might actually change over the next years when Apple opens up more to like web applications being installable on your device. So in the past, one super big thing for all kinds of native applications, no matter if you do it with Swift or React Native, was the argument that only in native applications that you install through the App Store, you can use push notifications. 
And push notifications are to some companies critical. I don't know why. Um, we can argue about that from the user perspective. Push is actually not too cool. So I don't like to be bombarded with all your marketing stuff. But, I turned uh, them all off of my settings yeah. anyways on my phone. So. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but just developing a native app gives you um, more access to the underlying device features that you're not getting through the web browser. You are getting, in fact, more than people think uh, at this point already through web browsers, uh, but not everything. So as I said, push notifications. Also, your web application is not showing up in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. So uh, if we're talking about discoverability, that makes a, a big difference. Now, this in the end comes down to what your users want. So for example, if you're like a company and you want to distribute some kind of internal tool to your people, Maybe you can do something like a progressive web app, which you just internally host somewhere and people can download it directly to their phone without ever going through the app stores. And within a progressive web app, um, that can kind of feel like a native app. Uh, you can update that and through the browser, you actually get access to a lot of underlying stuff. Like you can even use the camera through the browser. Like there are browser APIs to do this. There are even browser APIs to access the camera or the gyro sensor or stuff like that. But... It's like, it's not completely native. So if you want to get to the App Store, uh, if you want to target end users, usually you still want to go somehow for a native app. Uh, unless this changes in the future, because <laughs> I think uh, Apple now introduced or allowed push notifications for progressive web apps. So uh, maybe we're going to see a little shift over the next years. Yeah, that would be very interesting if they did that. And even if they started allowing like progressive web apps in their app store or something like that, like I think that would be a, you know, huge win for kind of maybe focusing on web and applications like that as, you know, there's definitely that benefit of if someone can download your web app as just a Apple app and they can also go to your website and access it through desktop on the browser that would definitely be a way to kind of solve some of these kind of cross platform issues of rewriting code for native and on your kind of web and stuff like that. So I think that would be super cool, but uh, who knows what Apple will decide to do here, here in the future. I mean, on Android, on Android, it works also pretty well already. Like if you go to a website and it is a progressive web app, you instantly get this dialogue to install it. And on iOS, it's basically buried in, in three menus and, None of my friends knows what a PWA is. None. Absolutely. Yep. Totally agree. And I would say that even a lot of developers don't really know what a <laughs> PWA is. So <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, uh, well, with that, I think that uh, a place that I would like to go now is, you know, maybe talking about some of this kind of cross platform stuff. So, you know, if someone writes like a React Native app or a Flutter app, and we've kind of been hinting around this a little bit, can they then turn that into a web app and kind of have a website? Or do they need to maybe use some other tool to do that? Or how does that kind of look? It's kind of funny. Like we start with a React and then we made React Native so we can do native apps. And now we get tools so to make React Native apps for the <laughs> web again. <laughs> like we, we're yeah. kind of going back to where we started. Uh, in the end, we will all do PHP again anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yes, um, what I currently use mostly is Expo. So Expo is a cool framework for React Native, which at this point pretty much everyone agrees that you should use it. Even the, the React Native docs say, hey, if you're getting started, just use Expo um, because you can still at a later point like opt out of Expo and um, use it in different ways. And Expo is currently doing cool things. Um, so I want to make it able, you, you can actually export your React Native application for the web, but to be honest, that always looks like trash. Like, if you ever wanted to use a website with a tab bar, mm, no, probably not. Um, but uh, Expo currently released something, uh, the Expo router, which has now file-based routing, which we know from all cool, like Next.js and SwelteKit and other cool things, uh, which more closely resembles what you see on the web. Like, you go to Riverside or whatever, google.com slash one. Um, this is a new concept for mobile apps. While in mobile apps, we only thought about screens or pages usually, and we didn't really care about the URL. But now if we use this from Expo, like the Expo router, then we can build a great native app 
and also have a static export of that application that we can use on the web. And they recently, like a few weeks ago, there was a conference where they announced like more things they're currently adding. For example, they're adding like a, a meta tag that you can introduce in React Native. Like this won't help you at all for native apps, but this gives you like SEO information if you build your app for the web in the end. So uh, they're thinking about the whole SEO aspect and uh, they're introducing like a get static params or get static path function, which allows you to do this whole static export stuff. So uh, React Native is taking a lot of steps into that direction. There are also like uh, UI frameworks like Tamagui, I think this is very common, uh, which is trying to give you like cool native UI and also a cool UI on the web. So I'm pretty sure we're just like one, two, three years away from having great React Native apps for the web. I mean, you can already do it, and I've seen it actually for, what, what was the Twitter clone? Blue Sky, right? Uh, so Bl Blue Sky is written with React Native and Expo, and their website was built with Expo and the Expo router as well. So if you have an invite, <laughs> check it out. Uh, it's not perfect yet, but I think we're getting there. For Flutter... They're also working on the same thing uh, to to enable like building Flutter apps and then making uh, port them to the web. In the past, this was like uh, the output was a big canvas element in which the Flutter Sky renderer was drawing all the elements. So it's not really that accessible. Uh, um, I don't know exactly what they're currently doing. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to work out something that works better because that solution is definitely uh, not a solution forever. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say you know, a few years ago when I was focusing more on kind of React Native, it was even further out from being able to do stuff like this to where it was kind of like, man, we're still a handful of years away from being able to just take your native app and use it on the web. So it still sounds like we're we're getting closer, but maybe not not quite there in which it's like this seamless kind of transition. I mean, the the one bad thing about this is still if you have already like a React website and then a React Native app, they can share like part of the code or part of the logic. But as I said, like it's either web uh, syntax or you have the native components in, in React Native app. And this is where what I use with Ionic comes in kind of cool, um, which is pretty much unknown. So in the past it was Cordova, now it's Capacitor, which is from the Ionic team. So uh, let, me, let me just give you a quick idea. If you have a React website, um, you can just easily install Capacitor and Capacitor can wrap your, your whole web app into a native application. There's really nothing else you need to do. Just install it and it usually works out of the box. Like Capacitor creates a native iOS and Android project next to your other files and you can run it. You can have like live reload and stuff. Um, this is not changing your UI. Like your website will still be a website. Uh, if you made it mobile friendly, that's good. Uh, otherwise, you might have to use some kind of native components. But Capacitor is like the the 99% code share solution because then you can really just use your React web application. You wrap it with Capacitor in this native container and you bring it to iOS and Android. Uh, and that's what I've done for, for years. I've combined this with Ionic. So Ionic is a UI component library basically with, with great components, uh, what I've been always missing in the React native world. Uh, and it works with Rea, with Capacitor. So those are like the three options uh, to me right now, Capacitor, React Native, and Flutter. Uh, un unless you live in the .NET world, there's also like .NET MAUI or something, but this is, this is <laughs> not in my I'm not circles. in that world, so I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> yeah, cool. And I'm glad that you touched on that because that's exactly where I was going to go. And I just smoked my bike with my arm there, so hopefully that did not do bad. Uh, but... That's exactly where I was going to go next was, you know, the inverse is, can you take your React web application and turn those into mobile applications? And it sounds like you can do that maybe a little bit easier than kind of going the other way around with using a tool like Capacitor and different things like that to kind of do that. Does that sound correct? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, many people gave it a try and they were astonished how great this works. Um, with Capacitor, you also get access to like the underlying uh, APIs, camera, storage, SQLite, wh whatever. Um, it wraps your app. The only thing is people say that, yeah, these apps are not native. Once again, we, we come back to that. Um, but they run at 60 FPS as well. Maybe React Native application and Flutter sometimes feel more native. Yes, I agree. 
this can feel because it's still like you are running a web application and there can be some limitations to that. Um, but you can also write a poor Swift application if you're not, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. So I, I think that provides kind of a good overview of you know, the state of mobile development and transitioning from native to web and web to native. So I think maybe final kind of two questions for you here, where if someone for, so for the first one, if someone's wanting to build an application and they want it to both work really well on mobile and on the web, what would you kind of recommend for this person? And then maybe also if they just want to focus on mobile, what would you recommend for that person? And would they be kind of different recommendations? Yeah. If you want something that works uh, on both web and mobile at the same time, and you're probably alone or you have a very small team, I would highly recommend to check out Capacitor because just it's really just one project you've write. Um, there's no big if else statements usually, uh, unless there's like a very specific functionality that only works on native. But uh, in those cases, I would say Capacitor, um, you can actually use Capacitor with whatever you want. Like you can use Vue, you can use Angular, you can use React. If you're starting out, I would just recommend give it a try with Ionic. Uh, you can still use React with Ionic. Uh, and this changed a few years ago, so this is also possible. If you already have an app, just drop in Capacitor and see how it goes. If your main focus is on native, um, I would probably try and use React Native, uh, simply because it feels a bit more native. Uh, it's still using React, which is like the most dominant JavaScript framework. Uh, I would probably only use Flutter if I really had good reasons to use Flutter, if I know like I won won a job in in the Dart industry. The Dart Flutter industry is very strong in my country, or uh, wherever I'm looking for a job, or for some reason I just love Dart, but or Google. But <laughs> besides that, I would really for native um, just give React Native a try. I'm pretty sure you would have a, a great solution. I don't know how your app turned out, but to me, the React Native app usually feels great. Yep, I I would definitely agree. I think it generally feels very much so like a native application that I would use every day. So I think that uh, I've had good experience with React Native. And I think that especially if you are coming from a React background or even a JavaScript background, then going the React Native route definitely makes a lot of sense. And I enjoyed the development for it. So yeah, absolutely agree with those. And then as for the final question, if someone is considering getting into mobile development kind of in general, and they're kind of thinking about, you know, is this a good path to go? Earlier, we talked about kind of how, you know, maybe in the future, we're going to have progressive web apps that we can download in the app store. And, you know, maybe that's going to hurt mobile developers and stuff like that. So maybe they're kind of thinking about this, not totally sure. So what would you say to kind of a developer thinking about pursuing kind of mobile development? Where should they kind of go for that? Would you kind of still recommend going that route? Uh, that's a that's a challenging question. Um, so from my experience and, and being a big fan of Swift, I would actually also recommend people to just give a try and check out uh, Swift. Uh, it's a great programming language and you're as close to the Apple standards as possible. Um, also, if you are like interested in building your own little side projects, I've seen some overviews that like the main or the majority of income is usually... Uh, coming from iOS because people don't like to pay on Android, I think. <laughs> so um, there's not really a huge benefit for me, at least, in learning native Android development. I mean, my brother learned Android development and he's been doing cool stuff like in cars and programming the, the in-car experience. Like, this is totally cool. Like, if you have a reason for that, then for sure, go get into Android. But if you're just really interested in uh, maybe creating your own cool habit tracker or whatever, I would just give it a try with, with pure Swift. However, you're still limited to, to iOS development. So if you want to like be future proof, I would still get into JavaScript. It's not too hard to learn JavaScript in general. Um, also, of course, pick up TypeScript because that's what you should use in 2023 and beyond. Uh, and then probably learn React. I think you, then you're on the safe side. And with that, you can build either progressive web apps or React Native apps or just web apps or get into Next.js. Like the possibilities are just infinite <laughs> if you're learning JavaScript. Absolutely. And I would I would definitely agree that that is a challenging question because, you know, it, it depends on what someone's goal is. Like, is it just that they want to build a certain app for a certain specific use case 
well, maybe developing just like a Swift app makes sense for that use case, or maybe doing a Google Android app makes sense for that use case. But, you know, if someone's just starting out in their career, they like the mobile app development stuff, but they still want to kind of future proof themselves and be able to develop like web apps and maybe have more job opportunities. And I think JavaScript React ecosystem is a good place to kind of go with that. So as you said, definitely depends, but I totally agree in that you can go into a bunch of different areas. And at the end of the day, you're going to still learn a lot about development in general and different software engineering principles, either way you go. And it's going to help you kind of transition to the next thing for sure. Yeah, the cool thing about the JavaScript ecosystem is, I mean, you can just get started with JavaScript and then you can decide, oh, I like doing websites and I like styling, so I get into front end. Or uh, I actually like server, let's get into Node.js or let's get into Nest.js and then something. Or, oh, I actually like mobile development. Maybe I should pick up Capacita and, and React Native so you can like easily branch out later after you get like a, like a few months of experience with JavaScript or a few years for that matter. Uh, and see what you like most. Or even change careers, like be a front-end developer and then notice at some point maybe I like back-end more and then you just transition. Absolutely. So I think with that, that's a good place to kind of call it here. If people are like, man, this guy knows what he's talking about. I want to learn more about him. I want to check out everything he's got going on. Where can people kind of go to to follow you and to see kind of what you're up to? Yeah, if you're interested in what I do, check out galaxies.dev. Um, also, I have a special landing page for React Native, so galaxies.dev slash React Native. This might change. This is like a, we started with a different plan and then we changed plans. That's how the world goes. If you want to check out Ionic, also check out the Ionic Academy, which I've been running for six years, or my YouTube channel, which is, I think, galaxies underscore dev as well. Uh, there's a weekly fresh video coming every Tuesday and live streams on Thursday. So uh, make sure to subscribe there as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me.